Okay, Mr. Wenok, it's not be aki, it's again aki. My name is Rebecca Many Gray Horses, and I'm from the Blood Tribe. I would like to welcome you to the online session of the Indigenous History Program offered through the Galt Museum. Today's subject is on the Blackfoot Traditional Territory and Ganeskakwi, the Land of the Bloods. I will focus on the seasonal camps and travels of the Blackfoot Confederacy and describe the transition from the buffalo hunting days to settling the Blood Indian Reserve for Chief Red Crow and his people. The Blackfoot traditional territory extends along the east side of the Rocky Mountains from the Yellowstone River in southern Montana, north to the North Saskatchewan River in Canada, to the Sand Hills, which borders the southwestern part of Saskatchewan. The Blackfoot believe they always lived in this location since time immemorial, and their history speaks of the origin and the continued relationship to the land in this area. The Blackfoot continue to live today in this area and have always and, and, and on what remains of their ancestral homeland. There is one reservation in northern Montana and three reserves in southern Alberta. They share a common language, land base, and common history. Today, they still practice the ceremonies, gatherings, and way of life as instructed by the Creator and left by the ancestors. There are three distinct nations, the Kainai Nation, known as the Blood, Blood People, the Siksika Nation, also known as the Blackfoot, the Northern and Southern Bikani, also known as Amskaba Bikani, or Southern Pagans, and they live in the United States, uh, also known as the Blackfeet tribe of Montana. Before signing the treaties, the Blackfoot Confederacy were organized into clans or family groups. This was not only for survival, but for protection and, e and for easily managed governance. It was known that each clan would be led by one or two headmen or chiefs. In the late 1800s, an author, John E. Wurz, that lived among the Blackfeet, estimated that the North and South Bikani had 24 clans. The Bloods had 13 and the Blackfoot had eight. But this is information from um, Anapiguan. And for our, our own people, we, had, we understand that we had several uh, clans and um, that probably far extended over the 13 that he counted. Um, and like, as I said, this may not be accurate as the clans were always moving and in not in one place to be counted. They, have been many, they may have been clans that have been dissolved or joined uh, with other clans as that was the norm in those days. Sometimes family feuds or a death of a leader would have the clans split up or join with other clans. The Blackfoot were free to join with other clans if they wish. Um, the Blood people favored the areas east, which were the Cypress Hills for their summer camps, where the buffalo were plentiful. Their winter camps were on the Belly River, the Highwood, and along the Porcup Porcupine Hills. To the south, the Blackfeet occupied the area as far south to the Yellowstone, and the Blackfoot, or the Siksika, as we know to, as we know today, they occupied the northerly part of the territory, which is um, known as the Saskatchewan River, and as far north as what we know as Edmonton today. The earliest contact. Um, David Thompson, a fur trader, spent a winter with the Bikanis in 1787-88 in what is known as today as Southern Alberta. Another, another um, white man, Anthony Hendry, was sent by the Hudson Bay Company in 1753 to establish trade in with the Blackfoot. He traveled with a small group of Crees southwestwardly to the Saskatchewan and over the plains to what is known today as Red Deer. There he met with this, what he called the strangers and urged the men to trade their furs with their company. At this time, he noted 
uh, they were using horses to hunt the buffalo. And he was impressed with their knowledge and use of their horses. These early historical recordings provide the evidence that the Blackford were in the southern Alberta area established as their traditional territory. See, uh, seasonal camps. The Blackfoot tribes had an enormous land base they inhibit, inhabited. Within this territory, they had areas where they would travel well over 500 miles during a yearly cycle to hunt, gather, renew uh, their ceremonies. In the dog days um, before the horses, the Blackfoot had a, would average about 30 miles per day. However, during the horse travel days, they would double the miles they traveled, which would be about 60 miles. Being knowledgeable of their environment and respectful of their gifts from, from the Creator, they would carefully select locations or places to travel to. There were many things to consider, and nature played a great role in their decisions. They paid, they paid careful attention to the new emerging plants, the return of the migration birds, and change in habits of the animals. And this is from um, the website uh, with Glenbow. When the, when the horses became available around the mid-1700s, the seasonal round was expansive and much more far-reaching than the dog days. A yearly cycle not only replenished their food, material sources, but also rekindled their mental, physical, and spiritual well-being. The average seasonal round usually started out from a winter location uh, located near a river where there's out, there always had to be a water source. And, and so it usually started from the winter. And the weather was another important component in this seasonal round. They monitored um, signs that they could easily predict you know, to uh, help them be successful in their traveling, you know, from the different camps. They knew where the water sources were. This was a main factor in choosing the sites to camp. The patterns reflected the uh, location of important foods and medicine, and the buffalo was most important. The camp locations were selected with all this in mind. Each location was known for the resources that it held, um, whether it was plants, animals, um, um, the buffalo. And so year after year, the people would return to these locations. In the springtime, the buffalo knew, oh, the Blackfoot knew when the buffalo plant was in flower and the buffalo calves were yellow, it was time to leave their long winter camps. Extended family members would split apart to follow the buffalo and uh, they would go out to the grassy plains, always choosing campsites, you know, near water and firewood. After a long winter, it was, they anticipated, you know, the fresh food of um, the buffalo. And, you know, during the winter, they, they were eating dried meat and berries. So during the spring, it, they would have, uh, they would feast on ducks, eggs, you know, duck eggs, and other, um, other uh, animals, um, wild, you know, plants such as wild turnips and uh, camas buds. In the summertime, when the buffalo migrated to the open grassy plains, um, it was known uh, to the Blackfoot as moon of flowers. The people followed the buffalo to the Cypress Hills or to other hunting grounds in the eastern region of their homeland. The summer brought together the clans to a big gathering where they would have their annual sun dances and ceremonies. These sun dances took place near the rivers where there was access to the wood and trees. After the sun dance, uh, the chief would, uh, the leaders would tell their people it was time to move um, to places where there was many berries. And the women would gather the Saskatoon berries and choke cherries, 
um, all the berries and they would start harvesting them for the winter. In the fall, when the leaves were yellow and the time of first frost, uh, the leaders would announce it was time to move to where the choke cherries were ripe. The women would then pick, uh, pound them, and make them into pemmican. Um, when the geese fly south was the most important buffalo hunt of the year. This was the fall time, and this is a time to prepare for the winter. And, you know, this occupied everybody's time. It was also the time when the people went to the hills and mountains to get new uh, lodge poles for their, uh, for their camps. When the trading posts were established, the Blackfoot hunted uh, wolves, badgers, skunks, antelopes, and, and buffalo, and they would go and trade these hides and pelts. And um, so the, then the, fur, uh, the trading forts became part of their seasonal rounds, and they would look forward to the goods that they would acquire through these trades. In the winter, like I mentioned before, um, they would send scouts out, you know, to where they could. There was water source and there was uh, firewood usually valleys and protected valleys. The scouts would be sent out in October and November. And then when they would come back, then the leaders would consider the information that came from the scouts. And then, um, then they would select the location that would fit, fit the needs of the tribe. The ideal locations were always in protected valleys where the people were sheltered from the snow and cold. Camps were arranged along rivers for fresh water where firewood could easily be found to keep the lodges warm. Um, and the buffalo also wintered in the valley bottoms. And at this time, the buffalo were prime and fat. When there was a winter hunt, it was required to have full tribal participation to conduct a successful hunt. Um, Hunting continued into the moon where the buffalo calves are black. And this is when the heavy snows came in. in Jan this was usually in January. It was important that they hunt only two to four-year-old heifers. They dried the meat and processed the hide into winter robes. And they left the hair, you know, for the warmth. Um, and also other um, animals were hunted, the elk, the deer and um, sometimes moose was to be found. Bull berries, rose hips, and silver berries were ready to be harvested too at that time. Winter days were long and provided a time for the, um, you know, for the Blackfoot people to rest um, um, and pass time. And this is also the time when they would teach their young ones about their traditions. Um, and they would tell, you know, their stories, their uh, traditional stories. A lot of socializing happened during this time, and children had the opportunity to uh, play, and there was traditional winter sport games. And then on cold winter nights, uh, the elders would, um, uh, they would sit in their warm teepees, and the children would listen to the elders um, talk, you know, about the, their stories, their legends, Napi stories. And the elders, um, the elders were really smart in being able to be predict how the future would be by observant animals and, and also how to know the different, they, you know, they were different moons. Uh, there was um, instructions that came from those, uh, the moons and uh, the different uh, times of the year. Um, so this yearly cycle of the Blackfoot was divided into four seasons. Um, and um, in the days when the buffalo still, war, uh, were still roamed and they were still doing their buffalo hunts, um, um, their, lo their location, they, they really followed... Um, where the buffalo were and where they would get their food and their resources. And like I said, each location was known for the resources it, um, it held. And then the buffalo days were ending. By the late 
1800s, the buffalo had diminished down to nothing. And in extreme measures by whites and Métis buffalo were killed only for their hides and the rest left to rot. In 1877, uh, the Council of the Northwest Territories were alarmed at how fast the buffalo were diminishing. In 1879, the Blackfoot and the Blood Tribe um, in Canada were starving, and they, they were out hunting. They were still hunting. By 1879, they were still hunting uh, the buffalo, and they were in Montana. And because there was no more hunt, uh, buffalo to hunt, um, Chief Red Crow brought his people um, to Fort McLeod, and they met with the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. And they asked, you know, Chief Reco asked, where is the land that we're, we're to settle? After, um, because by the, they had signed the treaty in 1877. And not long after that, the buffalo were gone. And so um, Chief Reco brought his people back up and were, um, were talking about where they would settle. Um, at the time of uh, uh, Treaty 7 signing, uh, Reiko didn't fully understand the concept of living on a reserve and having lived life with the cycle of the seasons, following the buffalo. And so the concept of living a, um, a life uh, on a piece of land and not being able to move about was something he couldn't understand. And he was known to have stated, what is a reserve? How could any Indian stay in one place without moving? How could he hunt the buffalo, which the commissioner said the queen was going to preserve? And But however, Crowfoot, on the other hand, understood more than wrote, Red Crow, at least that's what uh, um, this book said um, with Hugh Dempsey. Um, and so at the advice of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Crowfoot agreed to a four mile strip um, that would start from the Blackfoot Crossing all the way to the Cypress Hills. And this land was designated as a combined reserve for the Blackfoot, the Blood and the Sarsi. And when the, um, and so when Red Crow came to find where he was supposed to bring his people to, he, he then realized that the land that was set aside for the blood people was uh, included in the strip from uh, Blackfoot Cross and all the way to Cypress Hills, and he didn't agree with that. And so he went to go uh, renegotiate with, um, with the... Um, um, commissioners um, and uh, with the RCMP and um, and then he met with them and he told them that that is not where he wants to be that he wants to be where his uh, the, his winter camps and so um, uh, so he arranged a meeting with the then Indian Commissioner Edward D down dude to discuss the location of the blood reserve. And the commissioner then explained to Red Crow that, you know, this is the process for selecting a new reserve and it has to be approved by Her Majesty. So on uh, September 29th, uh, 1880, Red Crow set out with the commissioner, um, Norman McLeod and John McDougall to assess land for the new reserve. Red Crow chose the land south of the Be Belly River from the fork of um, the Kootenai River eastward. The same year, family started. Oh, okay, so this is um, where he chose to have um, this, his uh, reserve, his new reserve. So in 1882, it was um, surveyed and um, um by this land surveyor by the name of John Nielsen. And um, he reported that um, 
the reserve occupies a tract of land lying between and bounded by bounded by the St. Mary and Belly River and um, and nine miles north of the international boundary of international border. And July, so July, in July, July 2nd, 1883, another treaty was signed by the, uh, this amendment to the treaty was signed by the Bloods. And uh, it was ratified by Ottawa on March the 2nd, 1885, um, to assert the location of the new reserve. So um, the survey, the reserve was surveyed twice in 1882 and 1883. The 1882 survey um, determined the reserve to be 650 square miles. And then the second one was uh, surveyed at 547.5 square miles. Um, so there, there was that discrepancy, and this, this, um, because of this discrepancy, it is it became known today as what we call the big claim, and we have won. Uh, the blood tribe has won um, this land claim, and so uh, right now the um, the government is um, uh, put an appeal in. So, um, but they did win the court case. So. Um, it still has to be worked out. So in 1882, um, when after Red Crow uh, picked out the site where the, the Blood Indian Reserve would be, um, he brought his people there and they start. They settled into reserve life and they began to build uh, sod homes and they began to farm. And um, and Red Crow told them, you know, to um, spread out and start homestead in the reserve um, with their respective clans, and they did so. Um, shortly after that, um, there was years passed, you know, and they start to learn how to farm, and they became really successful in farming. And then there was many times when settlers would petition the government um, to get the blood tribe to uh, sell their land and open it up for leasing. Uh, there's one particular story of uh, Chief Crop Haired Wolf who staunchly refused to sell the land. He was adamant uh, against uh, selling the land. And he made a promise to his father, uh, his adopted father, Red Crow, that he would never sell the land. And he urged his people um, to see, you know, that it wouldn't be um, beneficial to the people if they would sell the land. And he picked up some grass and he said, this we will sell, but underneath it, the earth, we will never sell. And so he held on to that belief and he passed that belief on to uh, generations. And to this day, um, the blood people have never, ever sold their land uh, because of... Um, the instructions on, uh, you know, from our ancestors. So then farming and ranching became a new way of life for the blood people. And um, like all First Nations, um, the blood tribe used the Indian Act to allot and parcel out land to its members. Under the Indian Act, individual band members were given allotments. The Indian Act defines allotments as an allotment is the right to use and occupy a parcel of reserved land. Allotment, allotments must be approved by the band council and the minister. However, the legal title to the land remains with the crown. So from the time of settlement of the reserve in the later 1800s, the blood tribe members attempted to farm and ranch as a new lifestyle. And many members took up farming and ranching and succeeded in this endeavor. Some farming more than a section at a time. This became their new livelihood. By the 1950s, the blood people were farming their own land and grazing their cattle as well. Some became wealthy farmers and ranchers. But with the Indian Act system in place, they could not compete 
with their non-Indian counterparts. And they ended up having to lease out their land to non-Indian farmers. A blood Indian farmer could not go to a bank to make a loan for mis machinery as they had no collateral. They could, we cannot use the land for collateral. The land allotted to them was considered to be held in trust and not owned outright in fee simple. The Blood uh, Land Management website sums up the attempts made, in, made with farming, and this is what they stated. Up until the mid-1950s, the Bloods were directly involved in agricultural production and actively farmed and grazed the blood reserve with their own human and equipment resources. As agriculture technology and equipment improved, costs to acquire in this new equipment increased, and due to limited financial resources, the Bloods could not keep pace with their competitors. As a result, around the 1960s, the concept of leasing rent to non-blood members was introduced to the blood reserve, where crop production became the responsibility of a new leasee. Numerous blood tribe members continued their own crop productions, you know, operations, but they were gradually replaced. Uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s by um, non uh, by non blood farmers, and this um, continued to escalate um, where um, the need, you know, the high cost and um, machines and the improvements in technology uh, continued to escalate the need to lease out the land to non native farmers. It became more financially feasible to rent the land. Um, and, you know, there still might be today uh, individuals that uh, farm their own land while the rest uh, lease out their uh, land to um, non-native uh, farmers. So this is the, um, this is the um, session um, I talked about uh, that I'm talking about that um, that we're talking about today. Um, uh, what I wanted to do was um, provide a picture of how our um, our our before contact, what our lifestyle was like as Blackfoot people, the seasonal round, and what our lifestyle um, consisted of. Um, and how we were taken from that nomadic lifestyle, those buffalo days, into being put on a reserve and having to adapt to um, legislations um, of the government, uh, these forced legislations where we had to learn how to farm and we were put on a reserve. And so this is... Um, um, a story of um, of how that happened. Um, so um, a lot of this information um, is based on a paper that I wrote for my uh, master's in jurisprudence and Indian law. I took a class, it was called Indian Property Rights. And so this is part, part of this was a paper that I wrote um, and so I hope you enjoy it. I wish this could have been interactive because I sure love um, answering the questions, you know, from the participants. Um, this is, um, I'm going to continue to do these um, sessions and um, I will, uh, we will keep you informed on this. So thank you very much uh, for uh, listening and attending this session and hopefully um, it gives you a perspective of our history, of how we settled onto the reserve, and uh, how we, um, we're how we're making um, do with uh, what what little we have. So thank you.